So when, when the first astronauts, when they climbed into the lunar module, after they completed their lunar walk, they brought along with them lunar regolith into the lander. By the time they removed their helmets and their gloves, they could feel, smell, and even taste the moon. The characteristics of this regolith is so granular and abrasive that despite them trying to clean their suits off before they climbed into the lander, they still managed to trump the stuff back in, into the module. It even got under the tips of their fingernails. This type of contamination obviously brought some great worry because potentially it could have harmed or even killed them. But it wasn't until they went up there that they realized what they were up against. Just to put it in perspective, the type of granularity that we're talking about, a sample taken from an Apollo 17 spacesuit showed that per one centimeter square, a quarter of a million lunar particles could be found. This sample was taken after the astronauts scrubbed their spacesuits and climbed into the lander and contaminated it. This sample was taken after the engineers vacuumed and cleaned the suit. Lunar regolith has been reduced to a small size conveniently through meteoric impacts and continuous bombardment of charged interstellar atomic particles. This is the type of, and this process happened over a billion years. This is the type of stuff that we want to use, this is the material that we want to use for 3D printing on the lunar surface. Samples taken from Apollo sites and lunar cloud missions took this dust, this soil, this regolith, and in some cases, 18% of titanium could be found per sample. If we were to visit these heritage sites, we would see elements such as calcium, aluminum, silicon, iron, magnesium, and titanium, all in the form of oxides. So before we actually start printing with it, we have to have a chemical reduction to get those elements into its pure state so that we can either use it for a propellant or for a 3D print. This next uh, picture, when I put it together, I was like, hey, it looks like a piece of pizza, but it is not a piece of pizza. What I want you to see here is the next time you look at the moon, picture it, picture that a quarter of it is actually oxygen. The difficult part is how do you extract that oxygen from those materials? This whole 3D printing business on the lunar surface uh, has been central to us since 2012. Uh, and us is, uh, we are team plan B of the Google Lunar X Prize. We are the only Canadian team in the international competition. Uh, here are some of our, our members. Uh, both are Alex's. Um, our lead is on the right. I had to stretch this picture a little bit so they look a little bit wider, but the guy on the right is actually, he's, he's always been chubby, but. One's a mathematician, the other one is a physicist. And together they bicker and fight and argue and come up with some good solutions. The Google Lunar X Prize itself, at a high level, it's an international competition where you have to deliver a payload in a form of a rover or a hopper and have that rover or hopper travel 500 meters and stream high definition video or images back to Earth. I met with some of these members and there's some good talent in the Google Lunar X Prize. And there are teams that are looking to use their rovers to find lunar caves for potential future uh, bases. There's another team that is looking, investigating how could we, 
how could we uh, mine resources from meteoric impacts and bring those resources back to Earth? Another team that shares a similar interest with us is looking to, uh, to build a 3D printing module that will serve as a proof of concept that 3D printing is possible using lunar regolith on a lunar surface. But why would we ever want to 3D, uh, 3D print pieces on the moon? Well, it turns out that launching a satellite to geosynchronous or geostationary orbit is far more cost effective launching it from the moon than it is from Earth. It also, the moon could also serve as a stepping stone for missions to Mars, as well as a fuel depot once we could extract that oxygen to find that hydrogen and um, get a, a propellant. Imagine that one day we could 3D print a 3D printer. And then that new printer would print other applications like a chem lab, metallurgy lab, communication devices. Imagine that one day in the future we'll be able to remotely use lunar regolith to print a central processing unit like the IBM S360 which can be printed today or be just ginormous but before I keep on throwing you into fairy tale the reality is that 3D printing is said to not be achievable by my generation this is said by a number of experts 3D printing on the lunar surface, that is, because we already have 3D printing. And uh, does that mean we quit our task? No. If we take a look at some of the technical challenges that are involved in 3D printing on a lunar surface, the actual print itself could be done using a number of methods. The method that we're going with is uh, to use spark plasma sintering. The actual difficulty lies. The actual difficulty lies in harvesting and processing that dust, that soil, before any print is made. Depending on where we land, we're exposed to different minerals, uh, lunar minerals. So we would have to break those minerals up and eventually reduce those elements from their oxidized state for our print. So the first thing that we're, our first task is we want to find similar size uh, particles that we want to work with, these elements that we want to work with. And one method of achieving that is if we were to take a plot of soil and statically charge it, and I believe this to be a bit of a romantic um, technique, but the lighter particles will float higher than the rest and the system will grab that top layer. Once that is completed, we're faced with um, filtering those elements because we don't know uh, which we want to. We want to separate them before we do a chemical reduction. And some uh, lunar minerals contain iron. Some some don't. So whatever processing, filtering processing technique you're using, at the end of it all, we'll still probably probably be left with 40 percent of the materials that we actually want to work with. So we'd have to run that filtering process one more time. Eventually we'll get to a point where we have the right grains and the minerals that we want to work with. And now we're faced with the task of chemically reducing those compounds from their oxidized state. Just to give an example, if, you were, if we were to take one technique, if we were to take aluminum ox, uh, alu pure aluminum, and uh, if we were to use aluminum thermic uh, reaction, we can, we can um, reduce iron oxide, causing that pure aluminum to uh, be oxidized again, and we'd have to uh, reduce that aluminum once, one more time. The beautiful part is that there are already many patents and experiments that were done decades ago that deal with extracting that oxygen and reducing those compounds into their pure state. This was done a long time ago, relatively speaking. 
I hope now the audience could begin to see the type of difficulties that are involved with 3D printing on a lunar surface. And this is why our team takes a bit of criticism when we talk about that subject, because finding a way how to launch a payload to the moon at an economic price is challenging enough. But why go to the moon and not start laying a foundation? Some of the reducing agents uh, that are used in the chemical reduction are hydrogen, chlorine, and carbon. Carbon is not one of the uh, elements that is found that was brought back um, in the samples from the heritage sites. This guy here, this is our rover. This is our th uh, f close to four years now. This is, our, this is our model, so it has changed. But it is made out of carbon fiber. And carbon is good for reducing such um, oxidized elements such as aluminum oxide and iron oxide. If done correctly, once this rover has served its purpose, we could recycle it for future chemical reduction. And if it's done properly, we can keep on using that, that carbon so it's not a one-off. So this is one, one method, one, one example of laying a foundation for future metallurgy or 3D printing on the lunar surface. Our team likes to add a complex layer to already a complex project. But if we don't ask the tough questions, things would be just a bit boring if we don't try to achieve the impossible. If our team doesn't even come close to the moon, but adds a drop of knowledge to that bucket, I'll be happy. The interesting part is this, tech, this, this talk is taking place in Ukraine, home to Yuzhna and Dnepetropetrovsk. We were there last, last summer, and we got to see the amazing halls with these rockets being assembled and their payloads being prepped. There are experts there that carry a wealth of knowledge that should be standing here in my stead. Use their talents. Lastly, if, if your idea is earthly or space-bound, to the audience I'd like to say I hope we all have the courage to push our ideas even if our ideas may seem as ridiculous as 3D printing on a lunar surface using lunar regular. Thank you very much for your time.